Hello students, we're going to be looking at chapter four in this video and this week we're going to be looking at chapters four and seven and so I'm going to go over them in separate videos so that it breaks it down a little bit because there's so much content um, to cover in these two chapters. And so first with chapter four, race, ethnicity, and identity. Um, race has played a dominant role in shaping contemporary life throughout the world. And so obviously, as we've sort of talked about, America is not only not an exception to that, but um, has had a great history, um, great as in a lot of history, um, with issues um, related to race. And so um, in this chapter, we are going to talk about racial categorization, which, uh, again, as we've talked about, meant for some groups, um, there's more unearned uh, access or, or privilege opportunities um, in relation to other groups. Having the access to societal resources or the denial of them uh, has a profound influence on people's quality of life. It also impacts what can be accomplished within the counseling setting. And so if a counselor has an, ins an ins insistence on um, the individual personal responsibility, um, it may end up making any frustration or depression that an individual is facing related to um, racial issues even more difficult or even worse. Um, you know, it could lead to potential feelings of helplessness. Like, you know, I came to a counselor to deal with these feelings and these situations I'm in, and I actually feel worse about them, um, or I'm being told I need to take some kind of personal responsibility for what's happening. Um, the issue of race tends to be most salient when the therapist holds um, a um, holds an identity or a, a more privileged racial background than the client. And so think back to the marginalized and privileged client and counselor diagram that we looked at earlier this semester. And so when as a therapist, we're holding more of those privileged identities than the client, and again, this chapter specifically focuses on race, um, those issues end up uh, being more pronounced within the counseling relationship. And so without constant awareness of these themes, it can really end up impacting the counseling relationship in a very negative way and also um, um, hurt the value that therapy can have for individuals. Um, our dreams, aspirations, long and short-term goals, passions, attractions, loves, and losses are all experienced through multiple ethnic membership and racial categorizations. And so we can't pretend that those things aren't impacting us or having an influence. And so many of our meaning making functions are constructed within the ethnic history and the ethnic memberships from which we come from. Um, and so again, in counseling, um, you know, helping your client to recognize those positions that they're coming from and those um, things that have had a profound impact on them is really important. Um, our successes and troubles are often understood through the ethnic lens because of this, and many counselor and therapeutic exchanges occur within the context of multiple ethnic understandings and misunderstandings. And so that's very important to remember as we begin to engage in our work with clients. Um, race as a defining domain. And so like the concept of culture, the concept of race has evolved in particular historical contexts, and it cannot be understood without investigating those contexts. And so um, just like anything, we have to look at what's happening around it um, and not just take it um, as, as an isolated concept, right? Like it's connected to the, the other things around it. And so like the concept of culture, race is not a stable concept. Um, there's going to be changes and differences in meaning and relationships and other things depending on the, the context from which it is coming from. And so the distinct um, or the idea that there's a distinct biological difference amongst people, usually with special focus on skin color, um, is intimately associated with the colonization of British and European um, discourse. And so as we've kind of talked about before and we're going to continue to talk about. A race is generally defined as a human group distinguished by common phenotypical characteristics that are held to be natural and genetic in um, origin. 
However, the concept of race is so deeply intertwined in contemporary consciousness that it's impossible to um, avoid discussing it and avoid uh, looking at the ways that it does have an impact and, and can have an impact. So when we look at the genealogy of the term race, um, it first appeared in the English language about 300 years ago. Um, the notion of race originated from the French language, meaning breed or lineage as defined by physical markers. And so it was more about your sort of like genetic, genetic or um, genealogical line and not necessarily groups of, of people. Um, but these markers included their skin color, facial and body features, and hair type, and so kind of differentiated sort of families from one another. Um, the genealogy of the term race as we know it, the way we use race today, can be traced back to a period when Europeans began to develop extended contact with non-Europeans. And so once they were um, connected with people from other locations, you know, people who may have been very different, that's when, um, our, our sort of modern concept of race became um, or, or began. And since the indigenous people of the different continents that the Europeans went to did not have the technological developments equal to the Europeans, they then believed that they must be inferior in some ways. Um, and so France Fanon's um, terms um, being non-existent um, humanity. And then that's where they ended up um, looking at, you know, indigenous people of different places, you know, people different than them as being, you know, savages, people who did not have the culture, customs, and technology um, that, you know, we as Europeans have. They must have somehow be um, less than. Um, the concept of human race is actually a much older concept than the modern term race, which refers to human beings of different physical characteristics. It is the application of that idea that the people the colonizers encountered felt like they were not fully human. Um, and that leads to the idea of racial type um, before this modern concept of race. And so it just began that differentiation between, you know, being the human race and being less than the human race. As Darwinian ideas about evolution became popularized in the 19th century, the assumption of advanced or more highly evolved races took hold. So that's really when it, it kind of um, began to stuck as, as the modern concept that we, um, we recognize. Um, the concept of superior and inferior races was a welcome intellectual tool that could serve to rationalize and justify the treatment of colonized races as less than fully human, which, you know, as we know, led to slavery and brutalization and, um, you know, murder, rape, all of these things. Um, the concept of race thus served as a justification for policies of colonizing conquest and economic exploitation and for practices of enslavement and even genocidal extermination. The whole idea of the existence of race needs to be understood first and foremost as a construction of European colonizing discourse. It is a modern construct that has not always been around. It is more correct to say the concept of race has become naturalized in our understandings than it is to call it a description of a natural phenomenon. Even as the European empires and the political entities began to break up during the 20th century, the idea that whites could be deemed innately superior to non-whites persists, right? We see that today. Um, moving into the idea of eugenics, which is innately tied to that, um, was founded on the assumption of the prime importance of genetic inheritance and concern about the contamination of the race. And so if our um, race is superior to another, then we wouldn't want our lineage to be contaminated by these inferior races. Um, they kind of saw it as having weak genes. It's closely linked with the idea that those born of an inferior race were to be automatically considered a burden on society. In other words, eugenics was closely intertwined with this racist thinking. What is important for modern students of counseling, you all, um, to realize is that the people who popularized eugenics in the early part of the 20th century were by no means completely radical. 
um, or extremist. This was considered the norm. And I think that the reason that it's so important to drive this point home is to recognize that, you know, everything that's happening today, um, you know, we may think that, oh, well, that person's not really an extremist. This is sort of the, the common discourse or narrative that, that is, is perpetuated, um, but that doesn't mean that it's okay. And so, you know, obviously we're looking back at this stuff and saying, wow, this is not okay. How did they justify that? How did they do that? You know, um, it's because it was the norm, right? It was, it was the people that were not considered extremists who were bringing these ideas to the forefront. So are there biological differences among different races? Any contemporary scientific study that attempts to tie down the distinguishing biological differences among racial categories of human beings has been doomed to failure. Modern genetic scientists, therefore, do not support the idea that um, there's an existence of race as a biological category. The problem with racial categorization is that an unfounded biological argument has served the basis for political, social, and economic hierarchies to organize the nature of how the world is understood and simultaneously deny a large portion of humanity accessibility to human rights. And so despite the fact that this has never been found, that there has never been in, in a biological component to this, it still perpetuates and creates this unhealthy, violent dynamic that is serving to continue um, uh, perpetuating these systems and institutions of racism in our country and in our world. The fact that race is intimately involved in shaping the relationship between client and counselor. And so what do we do with that? How do we make sense of the fact that, um, that you know, this, this narrative continues to persist and then it becomes a part of the dynamics that we're engaged in with our clients? So what has the social function been of the term race? Whether or not the concept of race corresponds with any real biological differences other than that um, at the level of epidermis, um, we know that it has real effects for social consequences. It is in practice a socio-political construct rather than a biological one, as we just determined. Race has served as a major dividing tool among people throughout the colonized world. Ascriptions of race have been used to mark people out for entry into privileged opportunity or to limit their access to such opportunity. On the basis of racial divisions, the social practices of discrimination have been, and in many, many instances continue to be legitimized, right? And so again, we're basing all of this on a concept that has not been proven. The physiological differences that serve as racial markers change according to, what, um, to which cultural constructions are dominant. So defining the boundary between one race and another is more complicated than people think. In fact, there are no consistent differences among racial groupings. People whose physical characteristics are at the borders or margins of the group are made into new races. And so at one point, different people may have been classified within a racial group, but if they start to move towards the margins of that group, they may even be classified completely different. The determination of which characteristics constitute race is, of course, a selection of physical characteristics chosen to be salient at a particular point in history. But the determination of salience is not predetermined by any biological factors. It's socially cr created. The categories appear to change not so much in response to the characteristics of the people they categorize categorize as in response to the dominant discourse of the day. And so what do we currently hold as the norm or being okay? And anything outside of that is what we end up marginalizing. Associated with the concept of race is the concept of blood, which originated with that completely false idea that racial differences are the product of differences in the blood that flows through the veins of people. But blood is still being used to describe interracial um, progeny. And so racial categories um, change over time as they are revised, contested, interpreted, 
and reinterpreted. This paradox that skin color is sometimes and sometimes not the primary indicator of one's race gets played out increasingly in our contemporary globalized world. And so um, in, in specific situations, um, you know, someone might be classified as, as being of a certain race um, because even though they have light skin, it's darker. Or maybe, oh, you're not a part of that group because your skin's too dark or too light. If that makes sense. Racial categories have always been relational. Um, they exist as points of distinction from other races. So it's really hard to define what a race is without talking about its connection, its similarities and differences to another race is sort of what it's saying. And so it's disheartening to see that some geneticists consider race to be culturally determined. Or excuse me, it's heartening to see. Um, again, kind of going back to the idea that this has not been established as a biological um, uh, factor. What are the effects of construction of race? Race is institutionalized in the United States culture and significant levels of human social interaction take place around race, right? Which we can kind of see. There are stereotypes of what races do or don't do. Um, people tend to group or or um, come together with people of similar races and, and, and skin colors. The racial category white is highly privileged status in Western countries, while the racial category black generally describes a less privileged status. Racial designation is always linked to the practices of power. And so again, there's this ongoing narrative that it's biologically created, but we see it in these social realms as being tied to power and privilege. Mainstream cultural assumptions held by large groups of people do not like to allow movement across racial divides. The power that derives, and, and this, I guess, I, I want to pause for a second. This um, comes into play, we see a lot when um, there's the, the us and them divide that takes place in our country of you know, someone of darker skin is considered a them and isn't truly American. And so um, when you see things like people talking about like those immigrants, you know, they may be American um, or they may have even been born in America, but they're seen as an other, an immigrant, an outsider um, because they don't have the light skin tone, right? And so that's kind of how we see this play out. Um, the power that derives from racial categories can go both ways. And so today, racial categories are used not only for oppressive purposes or to further cause, um, or to further the cause of European colonizing agenda. Um, many, I mean, right now we're doing a census, right? And so in many ways, local, state, federal, private institutions will track um, by racial categories. And so that you see on demographic forms, right? When you have to fill it out and say whether you're Hispanic, non-Hispanic, using those terms, um, or, you know, white, black, mixed, Latino, uh, Asian, you know, they kind of list all the different categories. And then we end up being categorized by that for different reasons and, and different, um, and to, le to different levels of impact. And so when a group's needs are not being responded to, advocate groups can use those statistics based on racial categorization and point out to politicians and decision makers the failure of particular practices and campaign for increased resources. So this sounds like a good thing. It could definitely be used um, to recognize that, that there are some races that are being oppressed, marginalized, and, and otherwise um, disadvantaged by these systems. However, it's not always used in that way. As we know, it ends up being used to justify the ideas that we just talked about, about one race being inferior to another. And so if more people in this racial categorization engage in negative behavior or have lower scores or whatever, it can be used as, as justification for them being less than.
To go deeper into the history of white identity in the United States, during the era of British colonization, colonizing groups created the justifying assumption that human groups are inherently different and that these differences constitute natural, physical, moral, and religious hierarchies. So automatically, we're going to put everybody into these hierarchical categories. We're not just different, but some are better or worse than others. Interwoven with the hierarchy is the insidious and widely held belief that some races are inherently more intelligent than others, and that those at the bottom of the hierarchy have reached a lower stage of human evolution. All social groups, including those constructed by the ideas of race, can then make their own hierarchies, which is what I talked about earlier when it's like, you know, I might be in this category, but I'm too light or too dark. And so I'm kind of put on a hierarchy within my own category. Um, and this, of course, is more than just race, right? It happens with multiple identities, religious, um, uh, socioeconomic, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and so from a colonizing perspective, whites generally represent what is normal, right? While others are them and not us, which is what I just talked about. This is why it is so common for students who come from Anglo-American heritage to report that they don't identify as belonging to a race and don't have a distinct culture. And so in thinking about your, your cultural identity projects that you did for part one, um, you know, I've spent a lot of time considering how I would write one of these reports. And of course, I can connect back to, you know, saying, you know, my, my father was 100% um, Irish, his parents came to America from Ireland. Um, so, I mean, I guess that's my ethnic background. Um, my mom's side is a little bit harder. Um, she is 50% um, Hungarian. Her grandparents came over from Hungary, um, but I don't know about her father, so I don't know what that other 50% is. Um, but to think about how I identify within those ethnicities, um, I really don't have any specific cultural practices that fall within those. Do I have some from other things? Like, you know, my mom's family, you know, all Lutherans, you know, coming from um, that area near Germany and stuff like that, you know, strong Lutheran presence. And so that has, has kind of come down in the family, but that doesn't necessarily have to do with my ethnicity. And I believe that a lot of that has to do with the fact that I am an Anglo-American um, and that, you know, in some ways, in many ways, um, the reigning cultural narrative here in America, it comes from uh, maybe not my direct culture from Ireland or, um, or Hungary, but um, from that general area, right? Um, and those practices end up reigning um, sort of supreme over others. Um, and so it's hard for me to identify what that is. And so that's kind of what the book is talking about is that um, it, it kind of almost erases it. I don't know. It's, it's strange to, to kind of think about. Um, but this failure to register whiteness as a racial category is sometimes to assume, assumed to result from an individual lack of awareness. Um, and this point has implications for intercultural counseling movement and those who advocate for self-discovery and self-awareness as the foundation for multicultural competency. Because if I'm not able to identify my own, how am I able to recognize other people's and not hold them up to the standard with which I believe should be there, right, based on my background. Um, there are real material limits to how much self-understanding can be accomplished within the larger cultural background dominated by a narrow, privileged perspective. Is ethnicity a better term than race? And so this is, um, I feel like a, a really big part of the conversation. Um, racial clear, um, classification assumes that pure phenotypes exist. Ethnicity, as we understand it in the modern world, is a much more recent term. It derives from the Greek word ethnos, meaning foreign people. Ethnic in English meant heathen. The general consensus now is that ethnicity does not refer to physical characteristics as much as the term race does, although there is some overlap. Ethnicity is a group 
identity based on a common history and a shared set of cultural symbols, and sometimes shared nationality, tribal affiliation, and religious faith. Whereas racial groups are considered to be a few, there are hundreds or thousands of possible ethnicities. Max Weber defines ethnic groups as human groups which cherish a belief in their common origins of such a kind that it provides a basis for the formation of their community. So some shared connection or commonality. Like race, ethnic identity produces social boundaries that define how people distinguish themselves from others. The boundaries, however, are much more porous and complex. As with race, a particular ethnic membership has meaning only within a social context in which the individual can contrast themselves from others to produce an us-them narrative. And so again, it works as a categorization to look at the differences between people. In the United States, many people use the word ethnic to describe a minority population that is different from the dominant culture. However, ethnicity is not really encompassed by those colloquial uses. As a categorizing label, ethnicity is not tied as closely to race as physical markers. A shared ethnicity is a more fluid association and is less essentializing than the categories of race or the category of race. Another distinction is that people have the power to name categories. A shared ethnicity is not just assigned and defined by people outside of the group. Belonging is typically named and asserted by group members themselves on the basis of those shared experiences. And so ethnicity isn't just defined by other people the way that race might be. Um, but you can select inclusion in an ethnicity because of those commonalities and those, those shared things um, in a much different way than you could with race because race is externally defined. All ethnic groups are certainly capable of believing they are superior to others, but the reference point is not biological inferiority or superiority as it is with race. Because again, that perpetuating narrative is that race is somehow biologically um, created, even though we know that it's not. Um, so a moral force of the categories ethnicity and race operate at very different levels and degrees of magnitude. While race is the fundamental organizing dimension in most of the colonizing world, it is not so in all countries and continents. The terms race and ethnicity are not mutually exclusive. Joining together around the history of shared oppression has provided a powerful impetus to build resilience and strength. Sort of like the Black Lives Matter movement. In addition to identifying themselves as belonging to a race, many Blacks have embraced a common ethnicity. As a self-conscious population who shared a homeland, a history dominated by slavery, a religion, a language. Categorizations based on physical markers continue to dominate the way that, the way that our global society operates. These factors have a huge impact on how problems for which people seek counseling are created. To not acknowledge the significance of race and ethnicity in shaping clients' problems and in raising important challenges for counselor effectiveness would be to neglect essential counseling dynamics. And so one of the things I actually just kind of reread was the ethics chapter in the Counseling for Social Justice book, where it talks about the fact that, you know, when we talk about our ethics as, as needing to, um, you know, first and foremost, do no harm and take care of the client, that's also what we need to do here. Focusing on the construct of race maintains essentializing and static categories and keeps our attention on physical markers as the primary site of dividing practices in a multicultural society. The problem with that is that it can seduce counselors into believing in stereotypical unitary conceptions of who and what a white person is, a black person is an Asian person is, and thus lead them into simplistic therapeutic directions, which was why one of the reasons that I wanted to move, you know, this semester away from, let's do a chapter that focuses on counseling with African Americans. Let's do a chapter that focuses on counseling with Asian Americans and Jewish Americans and so on, 
um, is because doing so, it really forces us just to look at these stereotypical um, things about the way that a person presents physically um, instead of, you know, looking at it um, in a more appropriate manner. And so um, the authors of the textbook say that they prefer the term ethnicity, which by definition acknowledges more directly the constructed and fluid nature of human organization, while at the same time acknowledging the defining power of physical markers in a person's identity. The term race is associated with colonization and is produced out of a colonizing analysis of characteristics of human beings, while the term ethnicity does not have such a problem legacy. Ethnicity acknowledges more the construction, reproduction, and transformation of societal, or excuse me, social identity, a concept congruent with postmodern thought. Race is more of a category to which people are assigned without choice, while ethnicity, as we spoke on a minute ago, is a group of people who usually have some degree of choice about their own belonging. The concept of race cannot just be washed away. It is a highly problematic concept, but it exists in the general discourse and everyone acts daily on the basis of shared assumptions of what it means. Race still has official authority behind it as well. Even though it is a social category ascribed from the outside, it becomes internalized into strongly felt identities. One of the other difficulties with the concept of race through evolution and interracial unions, a new generation have physical, have physical markers different from those of early generations. And so that is also what's changing over time, right? Race is, is constructed based on these physical characteristics, which, you know, if we look at it through an evolutionary perspective, are bound to change over time in generations. There is also an emerging challenge to the view of race as something fixed, natural, inherent, and the growing number of children whose parents form combinations. So like Samoan Chinese, Portuguese Filipino, Korean African American, right? And so we're gonna have those blends and mixtures anyway. So it kind of um, changes and, and has the, the categorizations of race evolve. So looking at the context with ethnicity. Context and situations play a very big part in the ethnicity and identity that people present to others. This contextual organization and situational change of ethnicity doesn't happen just at the community level. It often takes place within extended families. Due to the increased rates of movement, migration, and inter-ethnic marriage, ethnic boundaries can become less obvious, less compelling, and more difficult to maintain. While people are living with multiple ethnicities and multiple heritage, heritages, what starts to matter more is not the boundaries that separate one group from another, but the sites in which these ethnic domains where they will find acceptance from one another. One possible future scenario as a result of patterns of global migration in which there are fewer identifiable ethnicities but, and more multi-ethnic individuals. And so this is gonna ultimately change as well. The fluid and complex nature of ethnicity reminds counselors that we cannot assume that a person has one particular ethnicity, even if something appears on the surface. It doesn't mean that that is that person's primary identity. Counselors and therapists need to be respectful of and curious about the meaning-making systems in which every client is engaged. Ethnic understanding is vital to successful and effective counseling. But it's impossible to know just by looking at people or hearing or viewing a label that describes their ethnicity, what these important defining characteristics might be. And so don't just take what is sort of checked on that demographic form or what you can you know, infer based on their accent, their appearance, their name. Um, only through conversation can these characteristics be fully understood. And so in all counseling interactions, open curiosity and naive inquiry are essential to understanding the complexity of clients' multiple identities, ethnic histories, and the client's construction of their various problems, which is why, again, we talked about in the beginning of the semester how to open up the conversation about the cultural um, context with which the client is seeing um, or viewing their issue that brought them into counseling and even what that view on counseling is. Multiple ethnic sources of identity can provide clients with a rich resource bank for use in overcoming those problems. 
Just as it may be possible for ethnic boundaries to become more permeable and dynamic, it is also possible for ethnic boundaries to harden. So recognizing that as well. So how do we construct ethnic identities? There's good evidence to suggest that more than one possesses physical features of the majority white culture. The more choice one has to inhabit, experiment with, and claim a variety of ethnicities and identities. So again, it's that privilege pertaining to the lighter skin or the features that are typically seen in um, Anglo-Americans. So the further removed the person's physical characteristics are from white, the less one can claim that, that their ethnicity is unaffected by racial classifications because ultimately the more different it is, the more it's gonna be classified in certain ways. Bodily markers and dominant meanings that accompany them cannot be changed so easily. And so it definitely is a task that, um, you know, there has been work on, but there's definitely a lot of work that still needs to be done moving forward. And so many Asians, um, Latinx and Native American communities, but much more obviously Black communities have fewer ethnic options because of dominant cultural assumptions formed around these physical markers. In the last few decades, some ethnic groups have essentialized and reproduced the rigid boundaries of the colonizing culture to build a base for struggle um, and empowerment. This movement or this move by disadvantaged groups to wholeheartedly endorse a race um, as a meaningful construction has largely been fueled by ongoing disparities of status, wealth, and human and well-being. So we talked about some of the counseling implications that we have, um, but we're going to kind of talk about them all together now. Many counselors want to believe that all human beings start on equal footing and have the same um, life uh, chances. They, this is supported by the assumption that the dominant ideology in all modern Western economies, which endorses and supports the practice of universalism and individualism. One um, corollary of this ideology is that if people are not thriving, it is assumed that there's something wrong with them as an individual, something that they then need to work on. On the basis of these assumptions, widespread attitudes are built to either deny or completely underestimate the impact of powerful socio-historical factors at work, which again is why it's so important to understand those historical um, those historical factors. Denial of the power of present day colonizing practices protects those who are beneficiaries of the dominant discourse from confronting it in their counseling practice. Counseling diagnostic practices that alert counselors to look at the intrapsychic process of the client to the exclusion of cultural and contextual factors will always risk blaming clients for their difficulties and problems. Clients subjected to these inequalities may be easily invited to internalize their suffering and blame for themselves and their plight. So as we talked about earlier about how, you know, this can be really detrimental to clients, right? If we're not willing to look at these things, this is one of the ways that it ends up playing out is if you're forcing so much personal responsibility on them, do they then end up internalizing that, that oppression um, and, and start to, you know, blame themselves? They may feel ashamed of the way they're living and direct their energies into self-loathing, depression, and despair. They may be convinced that their problems as a result is a lack of a personal lack of assertiveness, irrational thinking, negative feelings about themselves as individuals, and not the context with which they're living. Other clients in the same situation may direct their frustration, outrage, and anger outside of themselves onto family members or the community representatives um, that are around them. A counselor or therapist can become an easy target for a client's outrage, particularly if the client is a person of color and the therapist is white. White therapists must be particularly careful to locate the causes of depression, self-hatred, anger, and violence in a wider socio-historical context, rather than simply attributing these troubles to personal deficits inside of people. The white therapist can come to represent for some people of color a modern day version of a colonizing master by using practices that build on the assumption of individual deficit. And that is not a dynamic we want to perpetuate. Yet the legacy of colonization might make it even more difficult for a black or Asian therapist to work with a white client. 
racist discourse can influence white clients to dismiss or minimize the expertise of a black or Asian therapist, which significantly disrupts the therapeutic process. And so this is not to say that we cannot have these differences in working with clients, but we have to recognize what the potential impact could be. Again, this goes back to looking at that, that diagram of marginalized and privileged counselor and client and recognize where we stand, where the client stands, and how that interacts with one another. Contextualizing and situating clients' problems in social and historical context can help diffuse any inclination of the therapist to blame clients for their own plight. Whites can also have their identities to totalized and stereotyped when people of color accuse them of embodying practices of superiority and uncritically assume them to be benefactors of racism. The white counselor or therapist is wise to pay close attention to any legacy of privilege and to be acutely aware of how this can play out in the counseling sessions. Issues of trust pertaining to the legacies of race and ethnicity can become critical in the counseling relationship. These issues are sometimes best addressed by making them explicit. Potential concerns can be raised as legitimate topics of conversation early in the counseling relationship. Again, in the beginning, doing a cultural formulation interview or something very similar. A culturally aware white counselor can also help the client of color tease out the differences between the dominant cultural practices of race, which cause oppression, and the practices of this particular white therapist and how they, they are very different. And so identifying contradictory experiences does not have to undermine the validity of the experiences of racism. And so I'm not saying that you never experience these things. You are telling me you experience them, and I'm not negating that. However, I, as an individual, do not want to perpetuate that on you. And that's where kind of having that conversation of culture um, really pay, plays a big part is, you know, being able to help them to understand or to recognize that, that you know, we as a white therapist are not going to, um, are going to do our best to be aware of the way that those structures play themselves out and, and avoid doing that. and even being open to feedback when it potentially does happen. Sometimes it might be difficult for counselors of color to see past white privilege um, certain clients have. It's gonna happen, or can happen. They may underestimate the suffering white middle-class clients experience even while benefiting from particular racist traditions. It is not uncommon for people who have been subjected to oppression when given the opportunity to engage in subtle oppressive practices themselves, either intentionally or inadvertently. Something to be mindful of. Just because the counselor and client are of the same race or ethnicity also does not mean that the socio-historical factors are not playing out in their therapeutic relationship. Within ethnic groups, established hierarchies can be built around physical markers, but based in the underlying dividing lines of race. And so again, we talked about those hierarchies that can be created within individual races and, and the way that, um, you know, a therapist uh, of color may see a client of color and uh, make judgments about, you know, sort of how they're doing for the, the race as a whole, you know, um, and kind of perpetuate some of that internalized um, racism or oppression. Racist discourse has been internalized in non-white people's consciousness, just as it has been in white people's consciousness, consciousness for over 500 years via the European colonization. Sometimes the practices of racism are used by people against themselves as well as against others. So that's kind of how you see that play out. Significant distinctions also occur among people of the same ethnicity as a result of social class differences relative um, wealth or poverty and level of education. And so you can see this um, a lot recently um, with political debates and things like that, where um, there will be individuals of, um, you know, higher class or socio socioeconomic status who are people of color who are denying um, the oppressions that happen. Um, and uh, using that internalized oppression um, to potentially harm their own communities. This discourse often exceptionalizes certain individuals as models of the good black person and grants them special status within otherwise white worlds. 
the effects of poverty may feel much more foreign to the counselor um, in, in kind of dealing with some of this. There are many racist practices that take place among non-white ethnic groups. And so it's important to be, pay attention to that, you know, because is this something that you're seeing at play with your clients? Racist practices are expressions of power and they can be employed by anyone who chooses to use them to gain advantage for themselves by hurting someone else. Racism is a term that should be reserved for practices rather than persons. They are products of history of colonization and the justifications that underlie it. Some therapists assume that because they belong to the same ethnicity, they'll be able to empathize with their clients and grapple with concerns that only a person of that ethnicity could understand. Assumptions may be made about the client's experience on this basis when, in reality, the client's experience is very different from what the counselor imagines. Within popular culture, there are frequent contradictions of the assumption of racial privilege, and often they occur as a result of the inroads of colonization into the modern culture. And so as this chapter ends, um, some things to think about is the topic of race and ethnicity are sensitive topics. What was stimulated in you as you read the chapter, as you watched this video, as you think about this topic? When would you prefer to use the term race and when do you feel like you would prefer the term ethnicity? How do you feel about those terms and their usage? Can you think of an instance in which the ways that people use the terms race and ethnicity have affected you personally and how? Do an online search to look at or look for the validity of um, the concept of race. What did you find? Um, and also do a search for official government documents that use the concept of race and how was it used and which races were given, races were given official status on that. And so some things to think about and work on as we continue to look at this, um, this concept of race. And um, look for the next video on chapter seven. Thanks.